um, Adrian and Johanna have been talking about. Um, and it will become clear why I've got a picture of that man on the uh, first slide uh, in a little moment. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about <coughs> assessment for learning and formative assessment, as I said, as related. In particular, we're looking at this course as a focus, but of course we can think about it in more general terms. So, to start with, what do you understand by assessment for learning and how is it different from formative assessment? Concern is not on the grades. Okay. What else? Not just on the grades. Not just on the grades. It's on the outcome. <coughs> huh? You're testing whether the really outcome can be demonstrated. Yes. Yeah. Alan, I'm not seeing on the purpose. I promise. I had a doctor's appointment. So. <laughs> I thought that was the answer. <laughs> so okay. In traditional assessment, uh, we assess what they presumably have learned, whereas part of assessment for learning is that they are learning while doing the assessment. Sure. Wouldn't we hope that they do that anyway? Well, if they presumably already learned something and then they're assessed on it, then they have their, during the assessment they are not necessarily learning anything new, they're just showing that they've learned it, whereas there are some assessments where they're actually learning skills and learning knowledge through the assessment process. So it depends on the design of the assessment. Anybody else? Any other ideas? Okay. Um, a quote here from Davidson. Talk about an assessment of learning culture. Um, where formative and summative assessments are distinctly different. And this seems to be what Jay was talking about. That if you have <coughs> formative assessments, you can have summative assessment. Um, teacher and the assessor roles are clearly demarcated, but in assessment for learning culture, even summative assessments can be formative. to give constructive student feedback and, and improve the learning. Naturally, timing here is, is really important. Um, a lot of the assessments we do, particularly if they come right at the end of a, if it's a summative assessment and it comes right at the end of a course or, or a period of teaching, then you have no time to give feedback to students based on that summative assessment. So we're looking at being able to use what we might call summative assessments formally.
state. Essentially, it's about changing. He talked about changing, <coughs> essentially changing the way we teach. And I think what the first part of the session today was, was really a, a big part of that, changing the way that we teach our students by moving the, moving the space, you know, having them do stuff outside of class before they come to class. And not just read this article and come to the class, but the uh, kind of activities that, um, that I can see a bit more. We did huge changes, um, but if we our courses are, are assessment heavy, as we said, um, very much a summative or an assessment of learning culture. If indeed we hope it is more of an assessment for learning culture, um, what I like to think about is David Carlos and what he calls learning-oriented assessment. Because assessment makes the biggest part of our courses. And basically, we're, we're geared to helping students achieve the learning outcomes, and we are only able to tell whether they achieve those by um, assessing, uh, providing them with valid assessments to show that they can demonstrate their skills. What he called learning oriented assessment includes both summative and informative assessment. We looked at earlier. Summative assessment is learner or learning oriented, and it can direct students to concentrate on developing their, their understanding of the content, and cultivating key intellectual and generic skills. That's making good use of summative assessment, which I think is what we try and do here at the in the ELC, particularly when the, those assessments come in the middle of the semester. Then you've got time after that through feedback to help improve students' skills and make it learning oriented. Formative assessment is always learning oriented by definition. And it can take many forms. One of our challenges is to design summative assessments so that it performs a formative function. And they modeled this, and this, as uh, academics like to do, they like to draw models. To achieve your desired learning outcomes, you want your students to be self-evaluators. That's really important, to be able to evaluate their own skills. And they're only going to be able to do that by, with your help as teachers. Um, that the assessment tasks are learning tasks, not simply designed to measure their abilities, but also that they should be learning while we're doing them. And what they call feedback is feed form. Feedback they receive from the assessment tasks that they do, they can then feed forward into um, either the next assessment task or into the, the work that they have to do. Um, in our case, the work that they have to do through English in their university study. So how does that relate to this course that we've been talking about today? English for scientific communication. When we think about the learning outcomes, the learning outcomes in all our courses come in, explained in this document that we give to the students. The learning outcomes for this course, as you have seen already, it's about writing scientific <laughs> reports. Critique and synthesize sources in scientific and technical articles and reports. And report scientific information in writing to different audiences. And I think it's the second part is, is the key, and those are the things really that are assessed in a sense. In fact, both of them are assessed. There are two assessments. Assessment one writing, is writing a scientific report for specialists. So you can see the instructions there. Is, and, uh, as my colleague said earlier, this is a group report. 
you can see all the instructions here, 1,500 words. They work in groups three or four. Um, it's a report for specialists. They choose a topic of their own interest. Um, they have to research it. They have to plan their report. Um, it, it involves out-of-class desk and library research, reading articles. And then it outlines a schedule, if you like. By week three, submit to the teacher a group proposal. By week six, submit a first draft. By week seven, attend a tutorial with the teacher who gives feedback and comments. Feedback. Doesn't give the teacher long, does it? They submit in week six and they've got to get the feedback to them in week seven. Right? And then they have to submit the final review report in week eight. Pretty tight schedule. And that's 50% of the grade. The second assessment is writing a scientific article for non-specialists. So that's where the different genre comes in. The same topic they chose previously. Obviously, we don't want to have them go back and start researching another topic again. There wouldn't be no point. Um, this is individual work this time. They write an article, 750 to 800 words, this time for non-specialist words. Same topic, but they've got to think about writing it for a different audience. Okay, they submit the first draft in week 10. Um, in week 11, 12, they attend a tutorial with the teacher, feedback and comment, okay? And final article, few in week 10. 50% of the overall subject. So we assess those with rubrics. I'm not going to come to a, one of my presentations and not have rubrics in it somewhere. <coughs> I've spent the last two years working on it. Um, so we have separate rubrics for the two separate um, assessments. This is the report for specialists, content, organization and for the non-specialists. Again, content and organization, but we can see that criteria differ to a certain extent, particularly the content. Um, for the scientific report, evidence of very thorough research, extensive use of appropriate and up-to-date sources for the non-specialist audience a wide range of strategies to make the, the article interesting and relevant to the reader. For language and academic writing conventions, okay. particularly in the conventions, there's going to be different. It's a different kind of writing. So while we've got through the reference list, accurate, correctly formatted, appropriate reporting structures, and then we've got appropriate layout and format conventions for that kind of article. And then referring to sources of information throughout with integration of source information. Even within a, uh, an article for general audience, you still need to refer to the sources that you use. So we assess it in different ways. And of course, um, students are given these rubrics that they can then work with the teacher, and the teacher will help use these to help give them feedback. Okay. So thinking about that, Carlos uh, et al. Um, came up with what they thought were a list of nine skills. Assessment for learning skills. It should be employed when they're, when, they're, when they're while they're actually doing the assessment. If they're going to be learning from researching, higher order thinking, communication using technology, communicating orally or in writing, working in teams, evaluating peers, 
learning autonomously, evaluating oneself, processing and acting. Good. Okay, so what I want you to do, based on the information that you've got, and that's in your handout there, which is the, the subject and the assessment task information, plus if we add in what Catherine and Johanna were talking about earlier, about how they've flipped some of the content and some of the activities <coughs> during the course. Can you identify the assessment for learning skills that students would need to employ or need to engage in throughout the process of doing both assessments? Because you can see on a weekly basis they have to do this, then they have to submit a draft, then they get feedback and so on. So in the handout, what I've done is uh, in the middle two pages, is then you've got the instruction, the task instructions, and then for each of the assessment for learning skills. See then if you can go back to the task instructions, see, okay, yes, at this stage, then they're engaging in that skill. Or if it's not so obvious, say, well, they could be doing this. So let's see if we've got all bases covered in terms of the, the way that the course runs in relation to the assessment. Why don't you work together in groups? Although I've given you an individual sheet, I know, that's just for you to jot down notes. I don't want you to work with any of us. You know, somebody says, you know, I'm going to go back again. To the group. Yeah, Higher order thinking, what do we think? How do you define higher order thinking? What is it? Yeah. Synthesizing and evaluating. Synthesizing and evaluating. In what way? When they're doing research, they need to yeah. Yeah. They need to look for uh, sources of information which they think are relevant to their topic, maybe even when they're choosing their topic. Communicating using technology. I think as Adam said, this was 13 years ago when they wrote this. So I mean, it's, it's part of it. Part of life, and I, most most people, particularly young people, only communicate through technology. They don't communicate in any other form. So we have to get used to that. <laughs> and the other, the flip side, communicating orally in writing. In this assessments, in this course, um, how much of that goes on communicating orally? between the students. Presumably when they work they work in their groups in class. So they're doing that there. This kind of applies to uh, some of the points, but in um, assessment for learning, there's presumably um, that formative aspect where students get some kind of feedback and mm -hmm. but in things like communicating orally where it's not directly a product um, I wonder how many of these points they actually get feedback on. They experience it. it it's kind of ex experiential learning, teamwork. But do they actually get a sense of are they doing better or what can they do to improve? That's not necessarily embedded in that, is it? No, no. Um, particularly, I guess, in this thing, communicating orally, they're not assessed when they're speaking in this, in this course at all. So, in that sense, there's no formal or summative assessment of their speaking. Although, as teachers, we, we engage in formative assessment all the time in our classes. Right? And that's why Dylan and William talked about questioning techniques. When we're questioning students, we're assessing them. Right? You're assessing on their ability whether they they understand the content, perhaps, how their speaking ability is, and then that, that's, then you're making decisions as a teacher. Um, it applies possibly more to uh, secondary or even primary level, where you're seeing students every day, and you see them grow up. We see our kids for three, 13 weeks 
it's difficult then to make those assessment decisions. And by the time you get to know the students as people, they can't. That's the hard part. But I think in terms of communicating orally and in writing to a certain extent with the students and between the students, then it's, it's assessment and it's learning, although it may not be directly associated with the brains that they get at the end of the course. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess I was focused on opportunities for feedback, which you mentioned can arise incidentally as they're dis discussing and talking. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and feedback comes towards the end, isn't it? And they're working in teams. The first of the assessments is the group assessment. That has its problems, doesn't it? As Caitlin uh, pointed out, this, this free rider thing, which uh, seems to be an obsession <laughs> of uh, our university. Um, and this idea that possibly getting students working in groups just makes it easier for the teacher to mark it. They got one report from five students to mark instead of five. But it's an assessment for learning skill, isn't it? Working in a team. As part of the assessment, they need to do this if it's a group assessment. And they're learning, presumably, if they're communicating as a team. Evaluating peers. And it's written there. Peer evaluation while teacher is talking to individual students in week seven. Um, yes, I was wrong. <laughs> um, I didn't realise that this was out of class consultations and not in class with the whole oh, class okay. there. So this was an activity that if you had the whole class there, while well, one group or one student was talking to the teacher, you'd need to give things to do to the other groups and they could be peer evaluating at that time. How come you don't have a grade? for their group work, where each individual of the group could evaluate their team members based on commitment and content and contribution. And then for those free riders, you can actually reduce their grade. I mean, I had a group kick out the group member on their final oral presentation because they never contributed PowerPoint or anything, and he got an F on that sure. one assessment. So if you give more power to the students, then actually it might help prevent free riders. We do, don't we, in some subjects? We don't. Sure. I don't but in this course, there is a value here. A value. I think we do have an evaluation. In one course, the students are required to submit a reflection. That's right. Afterwards, there's no mark for it, but they did get downgraded if they don't submit the reflection, and then the teacher can respond to any issues. But here, you're looking at they're evaluating their group members based on their contribution, and if somebody yeah. doesn't contribute, it might. You know, it's not, of course, most people are, don't like to say bad things about their their, yeah. their their peers, but when it comes to a group report or a group grade, if somebody isn't contributing and they do all the work, if it is submitted as a group, each member of the group gives their own evaluation on the other group member's contribution, mm -hmm. then you could really substantially affect somebody as a free rider. Sure, sure. Group work has its own um, issues. Um, we've, had it, we've had situations where group reports have been submitted and part of a group report has been heavily plagiarized. And so the other group members have said, well, so-and-so wrote that. That was his part, and he's plagiarized. So you can't penalize all of us. <laughs> it is very tricky. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not directly valid to what we're talking about. It's common, but um, yeah, working in teams and evaluating peers. Um, one of our subjects does have a peer evaluation component, um, but it's five. It's five percent the overall grade, and they get five percent if they show evidence of having uh, having done that. And if they don't show evidence, they don't get. That's it. So it's not it's not graded on the quality of the feedback they 
if it's, it's graded on whether or not they've done it. So uh, it's a start. I think it's, a, I think it's really important. The students don't necessarily trust their peers to evaluate. But then it, then it comes back to, this, to the whole process. If, if they have a peer evaluate them, then, then they have to say whether or not, they have to think about whether they agree with that peer evaluation or not. And that then helps them reflect on their, on their own performance, on their own. It's all valuable. Uh, learning autonomously. That happens, right? During this course, presumably. They have to, they have to read articles. Um, they have to think about how they approach this particular course and this particular assessment. Evaluating oneself. Are they doing that? Do your students do that? Do they evaluate themselves? Do you ask them to evaluate themselves? Lots of heads in general. Processing and acting on feedback. I think that's one of the good things here, isn't it? Um, it's built into the into the course. They submit a first draft and then they get feedback. The group attends a tutorial with the teacher. So that's where the feedback comes in. And then they can act on that. Not, not have a lot of time, but they can act on that then to improve their um, improve their draft. What happens here? They submit their first draft you then give written feedback on their first draft, yeah. and you meet them. So they get lots of feedback, which then they can then act on. We do that in a number of courses as well. Do you do that a lot in your courses? You have students submitting drafts and giving them feedback. Um, and that then goes into the second article. Of course, by that time, the content, if they're very familiar with the content, what they've then got to think about is how they then write their own report but change the way that it's presented, make it for a different audience. You submit a first draft in week 10. Send a tutorial with the teacher. Is that done individually? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. you give feedback and comments to improve their art. So there's a, there's a lot of processing going on. There's a lot of there's a lot of dare I say assessment for learning, which is great. And it's great we chose this subject for, for talking about. Tell us what you told me about this seven assessment. <laughs> um, I think it really works, and I think that for um, you know the the first assessment is not that good. Uh, it's like a the genre is not clear. It's a, a cross between a, a scientific report and. A, literature review. It's quite a different genre to grasp, but taking that formal academic report and turning it into, we use Science Daily and Popular Science is kind of the, the article that we expect students to come up with with lots of pictures and we also get them, you know, they can do a website so they take all that academia and turn it into something that's accessible. To, and, I, and I think when I spoke to one of the professors in the science department, one of the students was complaining about this. 
second assessment, you know, <coughs> it's not real, it's not, you know, it's a waste of time, we need academic writing, and the professor said this is exactly what scientists do. You do a bit of, you know, you, you find something, you find some research, and then you tell people about it. This is what we read on Facebook all the time, you know. <laughs> you should drink more coffee, you should eat less eggs or whatever, you know, according to this piece of research. So, um, yeah, it's, it's quite, I really like the way the two assessments work in a two-credit course that, you know, it's, it flows really well and by the end of the you know the end of the course the students have quite a good understanding of a topic you know whatever it is and usually they try and do something within the discipline so yeah I, I like this assessment mm. but, but as you said they can do this second part really quickly oh <laughs> yeah um one of my students said to me this semester during her consultation, I said, oh, you know, I didn't have much feedback. She'd done a really good job. She said, is that it? I said, yes. You know, just make these few changes and, and you're done. She said, it took me about 45 minutes. Assessment one took me four weeks of hard work and all this research and putting together an academic assessment. So, yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking about the yeah. waiting. They don't complain that they're they have two assessments each worth fifty percent. Oh, it's been I've, I've changed it numerous numerous times, and I'm trying, kind of sitting with the fifty fifty because it gives individual students a chance to shine if they if they're in a weak group and the group work's not so good, and you know at least in this one they can. Yeah, I I don't know what would you suggest. <laughs> I don't know. It's been 46 years. In my research course, I have a group and individual element for their research report, like introduction, aims and objectives, and methodology is a group grade, and then results discussion, conclusion limitation is an individual grade. So it's an 80-20 split between individual and group. But yeah, it's... So they just do the one report? They do the, the group report together, and that's worth 20%. And then the individual aspect is worth 80%. Whoa. Because we found that, like you said, if they put in a weak group, but let's say you don't know anybody in the class and you're really good at English, you get put in a weak group, that weak group can bring you down a whole letter grade and it really isn't fair. So we had to look for some sort of way to balance this where you really want to teach them this collaborative skill because it's something they're going to need when they leave university. You don't get a pick who you work with, your boss is going to say, you two or you three go and do this project, and you might not like the person, you have to put away these personal biases, but you have to learn to work with people you don't know, and to put out that end product, but yeah, when you have a 50% grade, I would really hate this class, because if I got put in a group, you know, that could really affect my grade, it didn't matter if I got 100% on my individual. If I only got 25% on, on the group grade, I'm going to end up with a C when I could have had an A. There's <laughs> the feedback from the students regarding the waiting. The last couple of um, student teacher you know, meetings we've had, there's been no complaints, no mention of the 50 50. So when the students are not complaining, I'm thinking it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We just leave things. Let, let you got, you got to check fly. those Facebook boards, you know, the ones that are in Chinese. They have the secret groups for each university. <laughs> if it's, if I know nothing. I always <laughs> search my name on Facebook to see what pops up. <laughs> okay, I mean, there was, there was one more activity, which is feedback. That we're, clearly, we're pretty much out of time. Now you've adopted assessment for learning approach in the um, But, um, if you have time, you can stay in chat for a little while. If not, then um, hopefully it's made you think a little bit. Um, you may not be in a position to rewrite your courses uh, to adopt a more of a suspect learning approach, or you may be. But um, I think we've shown hopefully today that both we can uh, change the way that we um, teach and present the material through having a flipped approach, but also we can look at how our assessments can be integrated so that they are part of the learning as well. Thanks a lot.